book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 22. 21-22, book of Revelation says, But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Let's pray. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day and for the opportunity that you give us now to open your word. And as we open the word, may you open us. May you open our hearts and our minds to the f a fuller understanding of you. And the fuller, deeper, stronger relationship with you is what we ask in Jesus' name. Good afternoon, everybody. 12.30. I've been told what time I need to finish, so I'm not going to look at the clock. Is that all right with you? 12.30. But we'll see what the Lord God can do for us this afternoon. The title, the topic is Meeting God. Meeting God. Meeting God. See if this thing works. Not working. Is it on? No, that's why. Meeting God throughout the scriptures. Where? Can we meet God outside the scriptures? Because we don't know which God we're meeting. It might not be God. So we're meeting God in the scriptures. And the text that I just read a while ago, in the book of Revelation chapter 21, verse 22, has got some important words for us to understand this afternoon. What does it say? But I, that is John, saw no temple in it. Where? In the New Jerusalem. That's the context. John saw a vision of the New Jerusalem coming down, and he says, there is no temple in it. Why there is no temple in it? He explains. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, that is God, the Father and Jesus, the Lamb. John 21, 1, 29, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That is Jesus. So the God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. What a weird verse, isn't it? What a strange verse that God is the temple. Isn't it strange? Two questions. Why is there no need for a temple? Is there no need for a temple? Apparently so. There is no, no temple. If there was a need for a temple, there would be one. Because there is none, there is no need for one. And the second question, and most importantly, what does it mean that the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple? Two main questions. Why there is no need for a temple, and what does it mean that God and the Lamb are the temple? Good questions? I think so. So now what we're saying is that we need to look at the temple or slash sanctuary in the Bible. This is what we're going to do. In Hebrew, and the, the PowerPoint is just playing up with my Hebrew, is mikdash. Is the word mikdash. And it appears 70, 74 times in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, is the word naos. And it appears 45 times in the New Testament. So 74 in the Old Testament, 44, 45 in the, Old, in the New Testament. Do you think this is a recurring motive, a recurring idea? Is there a lot of, rep of occurrences? Of course there is, over 100. 
So what we need to study is the motif, the sanctuary motif in the Bible. So now when you see in Revelation 21, 22, when it says, I saw no temple that is now us, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its naos. What I didn't tell you is that the short definition of naos, the word for the, used in the New Testament, that we translate as temple, the definition is a temple, a shrine, or that part of a temple where God himself dwells. So if we now take this definition to, and apply it to Revelation 21, 22, we can see that when it says there is no temple, it's saying there is no shrine. There is no part of a temple where God dwells. That's the definition of the word. So now we need to look at the temple sanctuary motif, the recurring idea, notion, concept of temple slash sanctuary throughout the scriptures. Because this verse alone has got two odd questions. One, no need for temple. And two, the Lord God and the Lamb at its temple. So in order to answer these two questions, we need to go outside Revelation 21, 22, because in it, we have no answer. So we need to go outside. The temple of the motif in the Bible. So now I want to draw a line. And now the, ver the, last, the verse that we just looked at is the last section part of the line. Do you see it on the screen? So in Revelation 21, 22, no temple. Keep that in mind. Revelation 21, 22, no temple, and that is at the end of the line. Is Revelation the end of the Bible? So where do we need to go now in order to start our journey meeting God in the scriptures? We need to go to the beginning. That's right. So where are we going? Genesis 1 to 3. The question we, which we need to ask when we get to Genesis 1 to 3 is, is there a temple in Genesis? Come on. Is there a temple in Genesis? Of course not. There is no temple in Genesis. You can read 1 to 3 and there is no word there for a temple. There, there doesn't exist a temple in Genesis. So there is no shrine, no temple, no part of a temple where God himself dwells. So what we got now? We got at the end, Revelation 21, 22, no temple. And we have Genesis 1 to 3, no temple. Do you see it? We have on the two extremes, Genesis and Revelation, no temple. Very importantly now is that in the one hand, Genesis 1 to 3, is before the appearance of sin. On the other extreme, Revelation 21, 22, it is after the removal of sin. You see it? Yes. Sin is destroyed in Revelation 20, when the fire comes down. So Revelation 21, no, sin no longer exists. Did you get that? Yes. Simple. On the one hand, no temple before sin. On the other hand, no temple after the removal of sin. What do we have in between? Basic. Let's, before we go there. If, if Genesis 1 to 3 and the Garden of Eden had no temple, what was then the purpose of the Garden of Eden? Genesis 3, 8 says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. This is already after sin, when they have eaten of the fruit. So now here, it's saying that they heard the noise. Although this Bible text is after sin, it tells us a lot about before sin, how life was before sin, how life in the Garden of Eden was before sin. 
And maybe some of you have heard of the possibility that this text is referring to God's daily visits to the garden. Now, is Genesis 3 8 sufficient to establish that God was in the habit of daily visiting Adam and Eve in the garden? Daily visits to the garden? I think yes, for two reasons. One, it would be odd for God to come first walking in the garden with Adam and Eve only after they have sinned. It would be strange. Would you agree? First time God shows up, after sin. Strange, isn't it? Second and most importantly, they have heard the sound. My question is, how did they know that it was the sound of God walking if God never walked in the garden before? How did they know that that noise that they heard was the sound of God walking if God had never walked there before? It could be just an animal or a bird or something else. How did they know that it was God? Unless they have previously heard that noise and associated that noise with God walking in the garden. So for those two reasons, I do believe that Genesis 3.8 hints at the possibility of God daily visiting Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And now I have two quotes, one from the JFB Bible commentary it says the divine being appeared, this is in the context of Genesis 3 8, the divine being appeared in the same manner as formerly, uttering the well known tones of kindness, walking in the same visible form, not running hastily as one impelled by the influence of angry feelings. How beautifully, beautifully expressed are these words of the familiar and condescending manner in which he had ear to held intercourse with the first pair. And Ellen G. White as well, in the Ministry of Healing, she says, Adam and Eve, in their untamed, unattained, unattained purity, delighted in the sights and sounds of Eden. God appointed them their work in the garden to dress it and keep it. That's Genesis 2.15. Each day's labor, very importantly now, each day's labor brought them health and gladness, and the happy pair greeted with joy the visits of their creator, as in the cool of the day he walked and talked with them. Daily, God taught them his lessons. So we have scholars, that's the first commentary, and the spirit of prophecy agreeing with the position that I just put forward that indeed Genesis 3.8 is referring to God's daily visits to the Garden of Eden. So what? What does that mean to our study this afternoon? It means that if God really walked daily in the Garden, He went there for the purpose of meeting with his children. Would you agree with that? Yes. If that is so, then the Garden of Eden was a meeting place be between God and his children. Daily meets. Daily meeting place. So what we have now is that you remember our, our chart? In in our chart, we have Genesis 1 to 3 and the Garden of Eden, no need for a temple. Because the Garden of Eden itself is a meeting place. But what happened? We probably all know the story and they heard the sound already read that. And then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you are naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, you should not eat? 
Then the man said, the woman whom, whom you gave to me, to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. That's the first consequence of sin. He is blaming the wife. And more than that, he is blaming God because he said, you gave me the woman. So now 13, and the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So now she's blaming the serpent. But who made the serpent? God. So who is she blaming? God. And we all know the story then later in Genesis 3. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. And he drove them out, the, out the man. He placed a cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So what's, what's happening now? God is taking Adam and Eve out of Eden. Remember that Eden is the meeting place. So he is taking him out of the meeting place. No longer to come back. At least not in these conditions. So what's happening now? Eden as the meeting place because of Sin sees being a meeting place. Did you get it? Yes. it? Because of sin, God has to take them out and Eden as the meeting place, broken to pieces. So what do we have now? Let's skip this part. So now we have our chart again. Eden, on the one hand, Revelation, New Jerusalem, on the other hand. One before sin and after, uh, the other after the removal of sin. What's happened to the first one? Crossed out. So that now, during sin, there is no longer a meeting place between God and his children. What do we need now? We need a temple. We need a sanctuary. Now the sanctuary, we could expand this, but basically for us this morning, this afternoon, the sanctuary comes in three main parts. How many parts? Three main parts. And I've colored them to help us our understanding. The first part is the purple. The second part is the brown. And the third part is the orange. It's orange, but it's coming out as yellow, even there. <laughs> so the yellow. All right? Are we together so far? Quite easy to understand, I guess. So now the sanctuary, even destroyed, no longer a meeting place, Three main parts concerning the sanctuary motif in the Bible. Let's go to the first one. In the Old Testament. Sanctuary slash temple in the Old Testament. You remember? Mikdash, the Hebrew word. 74 times in the Old Testament. The second time it appears in the Old Testament. The first one is of no significance for us. So we're going to go to the second occurrence of this word. And it is in Exodus 25, verse 8. What does it say? And let them make me a mikdash, there it appears, all right, that I may dwell among them. Who is speaking? To whom? To Moses, saying, commanding what? Build me a sanctuary. For which purpose? That I may dwell among them. That means, in reverse logic, that up to this time, 
God wasn't living among them. Do you agree with that? So now there is a need for a sanctuary because God wants to be a bit closer to his people. Because that close relationship was broken because of sin. Eden ceased being a meeting place. And now God says, you know what? I want to be a bit closer. A sanctuary. It appears later on, and this is very important, in the, the, what we just read was Exodus, Exodus 25. Now Exodus 27, two chapters later. Look at what, what the, the Bible says. In the tabernacle of meeting, outside the veil which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall tend it from evening till morning before the Lord. Did you catch that? Two verses later, the Bible is saying that the, there is now what is called the tabernacle of meeting. Is this the same tabernacle? Is this the same tabernacle that we just read two chapters earlier? I think so, because it talks about the testimony. That is the Ark of the Testament, the Ten Commandments. And where were they? In the sanctuary. So now what God is really saying is that he is giving a definition of, the fir, of, the, of Exodus 25, 8. And the definition of the sanctuary in Exodus 25, 8 is a meeting place. The tabernacle of meeting. One chapter later, look at what it says. They, they shall be on Aaron and his sons when they come into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near the altar, that is the altar of incense, in the holy place. So without a shadow of a doubt, the tabernacle of meeting is the same as the tabernacle in Exodus 25.8. Without a shadow of doubt. We have one, the Ark of the Testimony, and two, the altar of incense in the holy place. That is clearly sanctuary imagery. So now, when we think about the tabernacle of the Old Testament, we need to think about it in terms of place of meeting. What do we need to think about it of? Place of meeting. The sole entire reason of the tabernacle is to meet God there. Look at what this text says. Exodus 40, 34 to 35. Sorry, that was supposed to be 35. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So who manifested himself there in that tabernacle? God. So who are or who were they meeting in the tabernacle? God himself. So the sanctuary, the temple in the Old Testament is a new place of meeting. Why? Because Genesis, the Garden of Eden, was broken to pieces. So now there is a need for a new place of meeting. And that is the sanctuary. God appears there. And then the high priest and the priest daily and yearly, they would come and minister and worship in the tabernacle. Now, back to our chart. Where are we? Where are we? In the purple. The first of the three occurrence or parts of the tabernacle sanctuary motif in the Bible. So now, if you remember... Then the kings come along, Saul, David, Solomon, and what happened? David says, God is dwelling in a, in a temple, in a tent, and I'm dwelling in a palace. I will build him a temple. Then it wasn't David who done it, it was Solomon, and then they built a temple, the big temple of Solomon. 
So now the sanctuary of Exodus 25 becomes the temple of Solomon. And everything that was in the sanctuary was transferred to the temple. Now, what happened to this temple, the temple of Solomon? Babylonians came, Daniel chapter 1, Ezra chapter 5, and what? They destroyed the temple. Why did Nebuchadnezzar come and destroy the temple and take the, the, the Israelites to Babylonia in exile? Why? Why? Clearly, the Old Testament and the prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, especially, they say it was because of the sins of Israel. Why? Because of the sins of Israel. So because of sin, because of sin, because of sin, why? Why? Because of sin, the second meeting place is shattered to pieces. In the same way that Genesis, Garden of Eden, because of sin, because of sin, was shattered to pieces, so the temple slash sanctuary, because of sin, was shattered to pieces. What do we need now? Another meeting place. Yeah? So we need another meeting place. And now this is when we come to the New Testament. Yes, they returned from Babylonia and they restored the temple, Ezra and Nehemiah and all of that. But it wasn't the same any longer. And God had a different plan. And now we get to the New Testament, especially in John chapter 1 verse 14. The Bible says, and the word, who is he? Jesus, and the word crossed that out and put, and Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Do you see the word dwell there? It is a powerful word. It is a beautiful word. Do you know what that word is? Probably my Greek is going to play up again. Is skeneo. And occurs five times in the New Testament. Only five times. Skeneo. And the word means to dwell as in a tent, to encamp, to tabernacle. So if we now make a literal translation of John. 1 14 with the definition that I just gave we do this and the word cross out and Jesus became flesh and tabernacled among us you see the significance of this the Bible is saying that you know the first temple the first tabernacle was shattered to pieces because of sin, there is now a new tabernacle, a new temple. Who is that? Jesus himself. He tabernacled. Is there anywhere else in the scriptures that we get the idea of Jesus being a temple, a tabernacle? Jesus, the new temple. Is there? Of course there is. John 2, 19 to 21. What does he say? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 40 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. They didn't get it. So that now Jesus in the New Testament is the new temple. Let's flash back a little bit. What was the purpose, the sole entire purpose of the old temple? A meeting place. So what is the new meaning or the meaning of the new temple? 
a meeting place. Meeting whom? Who is he? God. So if the first temple or if the Garden of Eden was shattered to pieces because of sin, on comes the second, the first temple and shattered to pieces because of sin, on comes the second, that is Jesus, and what happens to Jesus? Shattered to pieces because of sin. Yes or no? Yes. Why did Jesus die? Because of our sins. So Jesus, the new temple, is actually a new opportunity to meet or for meeting whom? God. But as I just said, on comes Jesus. And because of our sins, this temple is also shattered to pieces because of sin. Do you see how damaging, damaging and horrible sin is? For three times now, it has managed to broken the places of meeting that God has established. For three consecutive times, the place of meeting has been annulled, destroyed because of sin. What do we need now? Come on, help me out. What do we need? A new place of meeting. Isn't that right? Yeah? Yeah? Sanctuary temple in the New Testament letters. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom we have not from God, and you are not your own? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God... God himself will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple? You, I, us, each one of us is. We are that new temple. So now it's the fourth attempt. Which one? The fourth attempt of God to establish a new place of meeting. Do you get it? We are the new temple. Temple of whom? Of the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? God. Who are we meeting? God himself. Through his spirit. Look what Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 through 22 says. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having, built, be, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Who is that? Us, you and me. But, what happens? So what happens? We are the temple. What happens? Is sin still there? Do you see? Is sin still here? Yes. Are we still living in sin? Yes. Each time we sin, each time we do what God doesn't want us to do, we break that new place of meeting. But there's grace. There is mercy. There is forgiveness. So we are in the process of we are the temple and we break it 
and we are the temple, and we break it, and so on and so forth. But what's going on? This going back and forth is not God's plan, is it? God's plan is Revelation 21, 22. That is God's plan. So Revelation 21, 22, but I saw no temple in it. I saw no place of meeting. Right? Why I saw no place of meeting. Ain't no need for a place of meeting when God himself is there. Where we meet God there face to face. Ain't no need for a place of meeting because we will meet God there face to face. Look at what says Revelation 21 verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with them, and I will dwell with them, and they shall be, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and they and be their God. Do you see the word dwell there? We've seen it before. We've seen it before in John 1.14, the same word. Skeneo. I told you it was used five times in the New Testament. One, we just looked at it. This is another occurrence. It means a dwell, uh, um, to dwell as in a tent, to come to tabernacle. If we make a literal translation of Revelation 21.3, it is, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with them, and he will tabernacle. He will tabernacle. Now, of the five occurrences of Skeneo, only two are used for God. Only two. There's five. Two are used in direct, in direct connection with God. The other three aren't. So the two that are used in connection with God is John 1.14, referring to Jesus. He came and he tabernacled. We looked at it just a while ago. And the second and last one is here. Because this is the only two instances where this word is used in relation to God, it means that the two mean the same. So what he's really saying is, in the same way, that Jesus came and tabernacled, so will God tabernacle. Now, the question is, in which way did Jesus come to tabernacle? Did he come in a, 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 a spiritual form? Now, we couldn't see him, we couldn't touch him, we couldn't feel him, we couldn't hear him. How did he come? In a bodily form, in flesh. So we could see him we could relate to him, we could feel him, we could hug him, we could do all of that. So in the same way, God will be there. Isn't that beautiful? What he's really saying is that God will be in the new Jerusalem bodily, physically, really. He will really, really be there. So we'll be able to touch him and hug him, and kiss him. Physically, in the same way Jesus was physically, so will God be. Because that is, that is God's ultimate plan. He no needs temple, because in Eden there was no need for temple. Why? Because he was there physically, bodily. He, he came there to visit them. To talk, you know, when he made them, he gives the idea of him kneeling on the floor and forming Adam and, Adam and Eve, first Adam and then Eve, and breathing into his nostrils the breath. That is the kiss of life. It's beautiful. 
So God gives life to man through a kiss, a kiss of life. So God was there physically at creation. He was there daily in the Garden of Eden. That was broken. So in conclusion, on the one hand, before sin. On the other hand, after the removal of sin. No need for a temple in both. But sin came in and shattered to pieces the first meeting place. So when sin appeared, God now needs a sanctuary, a temple. So he says in Exodus 25, build me a sanctuary. That later on turns into Solomon's temple, but he was destroyed because of the sins of Israel. So God now wants a step closer. And God himself comes. You see, because look at this. In the Garden of Eden, God was there physically. But he ceased being. And then the tabernacle, God appeared there in the cloud. Let's question if he was really there or if he just manifested himself through the cloud. Let's leave that aside. But God appeared there in the cloud. That's what the Bible says. But it's not close enough. So the second step is Jesus as the temple. Now it's closer, isn't it? It's closer than in the temple through the cloud. It's God himself. It's more personal. Whereas the tabernacle and the cloud is external to us. Now Jesus becomes personal to us. Yeah? But then because of sin, because of our sins, Jesus died on the cross. So now, whereas the sanctuary was external, whereas Jesus was personal, God now moves internal. Yeah? Internal. In us. Is that closer? I think so. But still not God's ultimate plan because we're still in, in that process. So what happened? Once again, face to face. And there's no need for a temple. There's no need for a meeting place because we will meet God face to face. And what does it mean that God is the temple? What does it mean that God is the temple? It means that in the same way that Adam and Eve related to God daily, personally, so will we relate to God in the New Jerusalem. Personally and face to face. Without, no need, without need for mediator, without need for tabernacle, without need for a temple. Because God will be there, and by the grace of Jesus, we will be there to meet God face to face. Amen. Amen.